wanted to become like a, get a specialization. <laughs> That's a good. So don't try. Good morning, everyone. Morning. Good to see you folks out. Hi, Pam. Good to have you with us on this icy morning. Be careful out there, everybody. <laughs> it is melting, but it's slow but sure. I just want to remind you, they're having we're having Yegos this Friday or Saturday. I mean, this Saturday, and everyone's invited. Six o'clock at uh, Route 66. Talk to. Um, David or Ellie Bossard and get your reservations in. I forgot to remind everybody at first service, so don't forget Yegos is going on and get signed up for that. That'll be a lot of fun. Thank you to everyone who helped undecorate the church. John was a big help. Kate Coakley's were a big help. Thank you so much to everybody who was a big help, who was here, Wanda was here. Thank you so much, because that was a big job, and we didn't have many help, many helpers, but we got it done. So good job, everyone. Nate was a big help, and uh, he wasn't. he's not here to thank, but thank you for doing that. So the year's starting off in storms, but we're going to start off praising our great God as we continue persevering in our faith, and um, we got a great service planned. Happy birthday to those having birthdays this week week. Lots of folks having birthdays. Happy anniversary to anybody who might be having an anniversary. Nobody chose to get married in cold January in Illinois, I guess. (laughs) Smart. (laughs) Well, God is good, friends. All the time. And all the time. God is good. Let's stand together and join our praise team as we begin our time of worship. Oh, 
You may be seated. Let's pray together. Loving and gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you that you meet us here. We thank you that you are with us at all places and in all times, and we would know that if we just turn our hearts to you. And so today, O oh Lord, we are turning our hearts to you, and we just ask that you fill us afresh with your Holy Spirit. Accept our worship and praise this day, O oh Lord. Accept us as we gather to be the body of Christ so that we can serve you faithfully in all that we say and do, and that we can go out in this hurting world and share the good news of Jesus with all that we meet. We thank you, Lord, and we give you praise and glory this day. In the name of Jesus, we come. Amen. Well, we'll invite the children down. Two boys. Oh, Ms. Larkin snuck in on us. <laughs> Good morning. All right. How are you guys? Good. All right. We're going to start with what's in here. Oh, all right, nice and loud. Cotton candy. All right, you guys are going to help me in a second. Oh, Miss Larkin might not know about this stuff yet. No. <laughs> cotton candy. So when you, do you guys like cotton candy? What do you like about cotton candy? It's cotton? <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> what do you like about it? It's sweet. It's sticky. It could be different colors. It's delicious if you like it. It tastes different. Okay, now parents, what's the first thing that comes to your mind when you see cotton candy? It's sticky, it's messy, it's yucky. It's sugar, you're going to have a sugar rush. Hmm. Well, God knew when he made us that sometimes our life was going to be like the cotton candy, sweet and good. But sometimes our life is going to be messy, and if we eat too much of the cotton candy, we're going to need, what are these? Wipes. wipes. We're going to need some wipes to wipe away all the sticky and the yucky. So our wipes are going to help us think about how we're going to clean our heart. Yes, and it has to do with water. Can you guys think of something to do with water that would clean our hearts? Listen to Miss Shelley. She had an idea. Baptism. baptism. Right. Do, you, do you guys know what baptism is? What do you know? Have you heard that word before? Yes. You've, you've heard it, but you're not sure you need some help? That's okay. Well, our lesson today is going to be about Jesus being baptized and why he was baptized. Now, did Jesus need to have his sins or his bad stuff washed away? Did Jesus need to have it washed away? No, because Jesus was without sin. He was perfect. He didn't need to use a wipe. But he was still baptized by his cousin John the Baptist in the Jordan River as an example for us. <sighs> Now, when we get baptized, we are, before we're baptized, that's our sticky old self. And after we're baptized, that's our new creation. And we say to Jesus, Jesus, we choose to follow you. We believe in you. In our church, many times, babies are baptized. Sometimes they could be children your age. They could even be adults my age or even older. If they're babies, we know that they don't really understand what, their, what baptism is. So when they get to be a little older, they get to make that choice to say, yes, I agree that I choose Jesus. All right, guys, I need your help. Do you know where in our church, where does baptism happen? Look up here. Do you see where baptism happens? Do you have an idea? Okay, come with me. Show me where we think baptism is. Up here. Yep, come up here. It's okay. Where do we think baptism happens? 
get in the game hot and cold, you're getting very warm. A little closer. Yes, in our church, this is where the baptism happens, and there's not water in it now, but if we were doing a baptismal service, this is where the water would go. Pretty cool. All right, now, look really close at our white, like tablecloth, altar cloth. All right, do you see, how many circles by the dove do you see? How many circles? Three. Okay, and one of our, our friends from first service made a really good point. How many points do you kind of see here? Three. So when you're baptized, you're baptized, Pastor Mary will pour some water on you three times. Why three times? Mm. Part of Jesus, absolutely. That's what that means. But because we have God the Father, Jesus the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Because we have three parts to God. If we look up there, so we are baptized in the name, and Pastor Mary would say, I baptize you in the name of God the Father, Jesus the Son, and the Holy Spirit. All right, guys, come back down here. Good job for helping me find out where we go. Now, sometimes different churches do things differently. In our church, Pastor Mary's probably going to pour a little bit of water on you. Okay. When I was baptized, I was nine. All right, Coop, how old are you? Nine, so we, we were the same age, and I was baptized. I went under the water just like Jesus did. It doesn't matter. Sometimes it's just a little sprinkle. It doesn't matter how the water gets there. Okay? And it doesn't matter, again, whether you're a baby, a young child, or an adult. It's saying, I believe in Jesus, and I choose to follow Jesus. All right, let's say a little prayer. So I want you to think and ask mom or dad, if you were baptized and what they remember about it, and then ask them about their baptism. Okay? All right, let's say a little prayer. Dear God, thank you. Thank you. For the gift of baptism. For the gift of baptism. And for sending us Jesus. And for sending us Jesus. To be our example. To be our example. Who <clears throat> washed away. Who washed away all our yucky stuff. All our yucky stuff. So we can be. So we can be. In your family. In your family. In Jesus. And all God's people said. And all God's people said. Amen. Amen. All right. Good job, guys. Thank you. Thank you, Miss Larkin. So we continue in our time of worship. <laughs> It's time now for us to celebrate our faith by giving of our offerings to the Lord, of our tithes and our offerings. And so just remind everyone, we take it online, but we also have people who send it in the mail. And when we have these blessing times, we cover all that. It's a wonderful thing that God gives to us. And it's even better that God will let us give back to his kingdom. So let us with joy and thanksgiving present our tithes and our offerings to the Lord at this time. Will the ushers please come forward to receive this morning's tithes and offerings? Offerings. Savior has 
ransomed me Lord, we thank you for the amazing grace that you pour into each of our lives through the gift of your son, Jesus. And now as we pause in our time of worship to return a portion of our many blessings back to the work of your kingdom, we ask that you receive us and receive our gifts, multiply these gifts, and empower us as your people to do all things, to serve you faithfully and follow in the footsteps of your son. We thank you and praise you in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Well, friends, we are looking at a passage of Jesus' baptism. We're going to look at the passage in Luke uh, 3. So let's, the baptism is covered in all four Gospels, and I encourage you to uh, take your time to read those Gospels and find out about Jesus' baptism to learn and grow that way. And so um, let's look at Luke chapter 3, verses 21 through 22. Um, just a couple verses on the baptism. One day, when the crowds were being baptized, Jesus himself was baptized. As he was praying, the heavens opened, and the Holy Spirit in bodily form descended on him like a dove. And the voice from heaven said, You are my dearly loved Son, and you bring me great joy. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to our great God. Amen. Well, in life, friends, as in throughout Scripture, if we want to have healthy, growing, thriving relationships, we need commitment. We need to be committed to things of um, our family. We need to commit to people. We need to commit to activities. And we need, of course, to commit to our great God. And today we're looking at how God um, showed us the example of committing to an important act of our faith, which is baptism. 
And we're going to look at Jesus' baptism as we consider how committed are we to making sure that people are baptized, to encourage them to know and commit their lives to Christ, because that's what baptism symbolizes, to be part of the community of faith, and, and to help explain what does baptism mean, and in our understanding of baptism, why was Jesus baptized? Because uh, Jesus was without sin. John began the ministry of baptism. Um, the Jewish people had practiced baptism in different ways uh, through the different rituals of cleaning we would see in the the priests before t would wash seven times as a form of, of what we might call a baptism although baptism for the united methodists are is more formal baptism is a sacrament a sacrament is like a special gift of grace that we get from god and in the united methodist church we have two sacraments and so what are they Holy Communion, which we took um, last Sunday, and Baptism. Those are our two sacraments. One, we do at least once a month. John Wesley said you could do it every week uh, to take communion. But baptism, we usually only do once. We don't believe that anyone needs to be re-baptized. Uh, we believe whatever happens to you at your baptism and whatever happened at that baptism, that God is blessing you and you are claiming God as your God and that you are living for God later. Now, when babies are baptized, of course, they can't make that claim. And we uh, profess that we will raise them up so that they will later profess Jesus as their Savior. So as we consider baptism today, let's watch a fun uh, video uh, from a guy who knows all different parts of the church. And uh, he's going to tell us what baptism might mean. And we can listen to this fun video on Chuck Knows Church about baptism. The New Testament tells us that Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist in the Jordan River. And since then, baptism has been interpreted in many different ways throughout history. Now, baptism is one of two sacraments in the United Methodist Church, the other being communion, the bread, and the... Right! Cup! Good. Also known as the... Right. Eucharist. I can tell you guys have been listening during the previous episodes. Good job. You're growing up to be fine young chucksters. And since we've already talked about the first sacrament, it is now time to take a closer look at the second sacrament. Wait, we already did the magnifying bit with the IHS episode. Seriously? Is this like we got a budget for magnifying glasses and nothing else? You know what, let's put that away, shall we? I don't think we... Hey everybody, let's talk about baptism on this episode of Chuck Knows Church. Baptism. Some Christians say it's about salvation, uh, about being saved, or that it's a form of baptismal regeneration. Now, in the United Methodist Church, baptism is a means of new birth in Jesus Christ and a mark of Christian discipleship. Now, when you're baptized, you take vows that involve a renunciation of evil powers, a rejection and pledge to resist evil actions, and repentance from sin. You fully surrender to the saving power of Jesus Christ, promising to live as Christ's representative in the world along with other Christians everywhere. However, uh, most people are baptized when they are infants or very small children and are not able to declare these sacred vows. So, unless you're taking these vows of the baptismal covenant yourself, you are not brought into the fellowship of the believers, but rather of the baptized, the body of Christ. Now, in some religious traditions, uh, when an infant is baptized, parents speak for the child through baptismal vows. For United Methodists, the, the parents or other sponsors reaffirm their own baptismal vows. They do not speak for the child. Instead, they speak to their own commitment to faithfully live out the baptismal covenant. They promise, along with the entire congregation, to provide spiritual guidance as the child grows to ensure the child will be nurtured in a way that makes it possible for that child to one day openly profess their own baptismal vows of faith before the congregation. Now, water provides the central symbolism for baptism. 
uh, the cleansing from sin, death to old life, and rising to begin new life in Christ. Now, how the water gets used in the ceremony may be in many, many different ways. There's total immersion, or dipping the body entirely under the water. Or there's effusion, which is the pouring of water over the head in a stream. Or common in many churches is aspersion, which is the sprinkling of water. Now, always a generous use of water is encouraged. No. However one receives the water of baptism, it is dying to sin, newness of life, union with Christ, receiving the Holy Spirit, and incorporation into Christ's church. In short, a mark of Christian discipleship. To learn more, ask your pastor. Tell them Chuck sent you. That was definitely not baptism, by the way, folks. That was just a mean prank. I've been better off with the magnifying glass. <laughs> Well, Chuck is silly, but he has some good information to share with us. Well, today we're talking about Jesus being baptized because the Sunday after Epiphany in the church is often, usually, always the baptism of the Lord. And that's where we celebrate Jesus being baptized. Do you know that before Jesus was baptized, people really didn't know who he was? Um, he was 30 years old, we believe, when he came to be baptized. And until he was baptized, even John the Baptist, who was preparing the way for Jesus, did not know who Jesus was. In fact, he said he realized that Je he knew he was preparing the way for the Messiah, but he didn't know who the Messiah was. And so when the dove came down from heaven, the Holy Spirit came down on Jesus, it revealed to John who Jesus was. So why was Jesus so committed to baptism? He was without sin, so he didn't need to do John's baptism, which was a repentance of sin. And in fact, in another gospel, it, see, it records John and Jesus arguing that John is saying to Jesus, I should not be the one baptizing you. You should be the one baptizing me. It'd be like I mentioned this at first service, and people were kind of argumentative about this quarterback. But I don't care which quarterback you like, but it would be like Tom Brady. Now, I know some of you might not like Tom Brady, but he is a quarter. I know, boo, listen, here they go. And someone said I should have mentioned Joe Montana. Now, that'd be really dating myself, wouldn't it? I thought I'd be more up to date with Tom Brady, regardless. It'd be like a famous quarterback coming to you. And saying to you, hey, I, let's go out on the field and you throw me some passes so that you can show me some good ways to throw the football. Now, that would be ridiculous, right? Unless some of you, maybe some of you are better at throwing the football than I realize. But uh, it'd be very unusual for some super celebrity quarterback to ask us to show them how to throw the football, right? It'd be more for us to say if we need pointers from you. And so that's the way John the Baptist was feeling with Jesus. He was like, you know how to live faith. You know all about faith. You know how to turn to God. You are God. And he, I don't need to be baptized by you. You need to baptize me. So why was Jesus baptized? How was Jesus being fulfilling of all righteousness? That's what he told John, that we need to do this to fulfill all righteousness. So how was that being fulfilled? What did it mean? What did it mean that Jesus was baptized? Well, I talked about commitment. What does it mean that you're committed? Committed it means that you stick with something, doesn't it? It means you stand by it and you stand by people, that you stick with people, that you stick with God. You stay with them during great times when you're feeling on top of the world like you're an awesome quarterback. Or even during, you know, ordinary times when things kind of go stagnant or still. Or even on challenging times, like icy days or illness or other challenges that we have. It means we stick with things. We stick with people. We stick with, 
with projects, and we stick, most importantly, with God. That's what commitment means. It means we stick to it. And so what was Jesus showing us by being baptized? He was showing that he was committed to our Heavenly Father, to obeying his will, to doing what God wanted him to do. And more, and I think more importantly, he was showing that he was committed to us, that he was committed to sinners, that he was committed to showing us the way, that he was associating with us, that he was connecting with us, that he was modeling for us how to live. He was showing that he was committed to us. And so when we're baptized, or when we encourage other people to be baptized, we are showing our commitment to God. We are showing that we are committed to living a Christian life, and we encourage other people to show their faith in that way. Baptism is our sign to the world that we are for God, that our sin, we know our sins are forgiven on the cross, and baptism symbolizes sins being forgiven. But more than that, baptism symbolizes that we are God's people. Our God is for us, and we are for our great God. And that is a wonderful thing to be joy-filled and to be thankful about, that we are committed to God and that God is committed to us. When John was baptizing people, as I said, it was for repentance of sin, something that we all continue to need to do. That's a call of faith, and you hear me talk about that a lot because that's the reality. The water of baptism can symbolize washing away our sins, but one thing we need to be clear about, baptism is not fire insurance. And what I mean by that is if we have people baptized like children and we do nothing to encourage their faith, then they need to make a claim for themselves. Yes, they come part of God's family, but they need to profess their faith openly. And we need to encourage them to do that just as we need to encourage one another to fit profess our faith openly. So what baptism does for us is symbolizes how we are saved, and we're saved through the cross of Jesus Christ. We are saved by Jesus' death on the cross. And when Jesus was baptized, I believe he was beginning to take on that ministry of his, and that was the start of his ministry, that he was beginning to take on the symbolism that he was going to become the sacrifice for our sins. You know, Jesus was fully human as well as being fully God, except he was without sin until the cross. And we know from the cross that Jesus took on the sins of the world. And then he completely came all of what we are and more. And so baptism symbolizes our repentance of sins when we're old enough to hold accountable. But what about babies when we baptize these sweet little babies? I know, isn't she precious? Or he, they're adorable. When we baptize babies, we're giving, again, them the invitation into God's kingdom. And when the, we all have sin, even a baby has original sin, and so Jesus is washed away original sin, and that's what our water represents. But then we're also, as I said, we are committing as the family of God to encourage that person, that child, to be raised up as a person of faith. So if you know baptized children in your community or in your family, even if they don't come to church, you should take every opportunity to teach them about Jesus. That's our challenge. For all children, we should be encouraging because we know children are close to God. They're closer to God than we are. And so our time is to encourage children to come to know God. And then we have what in the United Methodist Church, we have confirmation where they confirm this faith that was made at their baptism, that they come to say, yes, I'm going to live as a Christian. And we don't ever re-baptize, but instead we remember our baptism and give thanks. And as they make their public profession of faith. So baptism is a formal display of that commitment that we want people to know God and to live as people of faith. And it's also a formal commitment that we're being transformed, that that water is washing us away and we're coming into new life. And so that means you and I are going to not just take things status quo all the time, that we're going to live in such a way that we're going to be transformed into new things, that we're working on overcoming sin, and that we're working on living a new life, that we're turning away from things that that have held us back, and we're going to live more freely and boldly. And we're going to talk about that in a few weeks, about overcoming fear and other things. 
The last part of baptism we want to talk about is the Holy Spirit coming on Jesus is coming down on Jesus. Now Jesus is the Godhead, which we believe. That means he's part of the Trinity. We talked about the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And anytime you see symbols, there's a three circle around this dove here. Anytime you see symbols of three, and and, and the church it sometimes looks like this. They do blessing like that. That's the symbol of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And in fact, Jesus' baptism is a clear indication in Scripture. People want, if people are arguing with you, which I don't know if they do, but sometimes people debate, why do you serve a triune God? Why do you have the Trinity? Well, this passage about the baptism of Jesus clearly indicates God operates in three ways. As the Father stating to Jesus, you are my beloved Son, his voice cries out as the Holy Spirit coming down in a physical form like a dove. That's the image. And as Jesus, the Son, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the Trinity. So that is where an image of the Trinity is clearly made. But what does it mean for the Holy Spirit to come upon Jesus if Jesus is fully God and fully human? Why doesn't he already have the Holy Spirit in him? Well, we know that Jesus is fully God, but when he became a human, he laid aside some of his glory and power. That he chose not to be all that he could be. And we know that because people didn't recognize Jesus. They, he was a normal human person. And he did normal human things, and he modeled for us how to receive and live into faith by praying and connecting to the Father, like all people of faith do. And so when the Holy Spirit came upon Jesus, it filled his humanity, I believe, and made him and empowered him to do his ministry, just like we need that to happen for us. Because remember, Jesus is our model. And so we need to ask for the Holy Spirit to come upon us to do all sorts of amazing things, things that we might think are impossible, like loving a jerk. That's impossible. But we can do it through the power of the Holy Spirit by being patient when things aren't going our way. Again, remember, commitment is not only when things are good, but commitment is when things are average and when things aren't going well. We stay committed, and the Holy Spirit helps us do that. The Holy Spirit also convicts us of our sin and reminds us to turn back to God. That's our message as people of faith. Turn back to God. Turn back to God. Turn back to God. Always be turning towards God. And Jesus, by having the Holy Spirit come down, that was a physical symbol for everyone to see that he was going to start his earthly ministry. And that, again, as I said, John the Baptist recognized Jesus by that. And then you see throughout Scripture, they say Jesus was filled with the Holy Spirit when he was doing certain things, especially when he went out and was tested. Right after this, he went into the wilderness for 40 days of testing. That's a model that we use for Lent. And so Jesus was, was filled with the Holy Spirit, but... He, was, he already had the Holy Spirit at his, at his access. And we know that also because John the Baptist said what? The Messiah, Jesus, will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And so Jesus didn't need necessarily to receive the Holy Spirit, but we needed Jesus to receive the Holy Spirit because we need to be reminded that we need the Holy Spirit. Jesus was baptized because he was committed. He was committed to God, and he was committed to us because of his great love for us. And so as we live out our commitments, we can model Jesus, follow Jesus' example. We can do what God asks us to do. How often this week have you done what God asks you to do? How do you even know what God wants you to do if you're not talking and listening to God? But the Holy Spirit helps us. The Holy Spirit lives in us and encourages us. And Jesus will give us the Holy Spirit. He promises that. He promises to pour out the Holy Spirit on us. And the fire to burn away the dross and to burn away the things that aren't important to, that aren't helpful to us, that are sin. So when you think about baptism, whenever we have a baptism or whenever you come in and just see our baptism with thought, or I would take it even further, whenever you see water, I would encourage you to remember that we are committed, that God is committed to us, and we are committed to him. And whenever you do that, whenever you remember 
that you're committed to God, that you belong to God, that God is blessing you and giving you the Holy Spirit. Whenever you remember baptism, that mysterious sacrament that has something special happen, remember that then you should hear like Jesus did. And whenever we do a baptism, I believe God is saying the same thing. That when baptism happens, God calls out, you are my beloved and I am pleased with you. You bring me great joy. Whenever we call upon the name of the Lord, he is happy. It brings him great joy. Scriptures promise whenever a sinner repents, whenever a lost sheep is found, there is celebration in heaven, more so than over a hundred righteous people. God loves people to turn back to him. And baptism is a wonderful way we begin the journey of faith, and it's an excellent way we show that we are God's, God's people, and it's a special way we receive God's grace and blessing. So if you need to be baptized or you know someone that needs to be baptized, please talk to me. I'm United Methodist, so I'm not in the spirit spirit-filled mood to say, let's just have a big baptism right now. But we can, I would like to talk and make sure you understand and have a deep commitment ready to do it. And that's when we would schedule a formal service and have a wonderful time. But if you want to be baptized and you're committed, I'll go get the water right after church and we will baptize you. Because I believe in baptism. And we should believe and follow Jesus' example in baptism and receive God's blessing. You know, friends, it's a hard time in this world. It always has been. But God's people live victoriously because we know truth. We know that Jesus was committed to us as well as being committed to his heavenly Father. That God is for us. And that we, being filled with the Holy Spirit as we live out our faith through acts of baptism and communion and other acts of faith that we are serving as God wants us to be, and we're living as God's people. And when we are living as God's people, it doesn't get any better than that, friends, because we know blessing and joy and strength that we wouldn't know any other way. So friends, when you remember your baptism, be thankful and give thanks to our great God that he calls us his beloved children, for that is who we are. Let us pray. Loving and gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for everyone who's come out today and all watching online. And right now, I do ask that your Holy Spirit just burn on our lives and come upon us. Help us, O oh Lord, to be committed to serving you and to being people who encourage others to serve you. Help us to celebrate baptism and to follow Jesus' example and to baptize in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and to live out our Trinity truth, that you are mysterious and wondrous, bigger than we can imagine, and that your love for each of us and our families knows no bounds. Draw the baptized to you, O Lord, this day, and help us to encourage others to come into your kingdom. We praise you and thank you that you meet us here. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, friends, as we come to our time of prayer, we know that um, we need to continue to pray. Dan is with us, or no, he went home. <coughs> oh, he's in your office resting. Dan was here at church at first service, and we're so thankful that he's doing better and recovering from that major surgery. We want to continue to pray for Gavin, pray for all of us who have sinus issues, but we know there is so much COVID, so much COVID out there. And so much breakthrough COVID. Ken from First Service, his brother Dave is in ICU um, with breakthrough COVID. He's had two vaccinations, but he still has breakthrough COVID. So please keep him in your prayers. Um, please keep uh, Phyllis and Sherry Ike and others who are healing up, like Dave uh, Nelson, who are healing and for other illnesses and long-term recoveries, like Pam still needs our healing, so keep praying for her. 
Jane Hoffman um, had her, she was to have tear duct surgery, and she had that postponed because um, she has some heart issues that need to be examined. But please be praying also for Alan Hoffman as he continues to recover. I got to see him this week, so thankful to see him. But just keep your prayers coming for people, and especially grieving people. I, I went back to East Peoria for a couple of uh, funeral visitation uh, this past week, and if we just need to continue to pray for people who are grieving. There's so many who've lost so much, and we just need to continue to pray for God's comfort. Our God promises to comfort, and he will. So let's be people who pray for comfort for others. So let's go and take all these and our unspoken concerns that you have. Let's take these before our God, first silently and individually. Then I'll conclude us with a pastoral prayer, and we'll all join together in the Lord's Prayer. Let us pray together. Lord, how thankful we are to have a place to gather and to learn and to grow in our faith. And we just ask that as our hearts are before you, O Lord, that you do forgive us, that you do cleanse us from all unrighteousness, that you help each of us to live more holy lives, to be better at listening and obeying what you ask us to do. Lord, help us. We know that when we are people of prayer, that that brings power and brings peace and bring special blessings into our lives. And we know that you always hear us, that any time we call upon your name, that you never reject us or turn away from us, because you are love, and you love us, and you are committed to us. Help us, O oh Lord, to grow in our commitments to you and to the ways of our faith. We ask, O oh Lord, that you especially anoint all who are sick, especially folks dealing with COVID and breakthrough COVID, we thank you for the healings that we have seen, but we just ask that you continue to pour out your deliverance. We pray for your protection for all of us, especially as we travel on this icy weather lately. Help us to be safe and just help us to be wise in what we do. And Lord, help others who are recovering from long-term health issues to find strength knit things back together, open things that need to be opened, close things that need to be closed. Just heal your people. We pray for our medical workers and ask that you lift them up, and today may be a day of encouragement for them, for people battling cancer, that today may be a day of victory for them. We pray for all those researchers that this week they'll have new insights and, and uncover new treatments to help people. And we also pray for those who are grieving, who've lost loved ones to age or disease, that, Lord, that you will give them your comfort, that you'll speak your word of hope and, and peace to them in new ways, that you'll give them strength, that you'll help them not to be overcome by their grief and not to let grief change you. We just ask, O oh Lord, that your special deliverance rest on all your people and especially on us right now. Again, we just ask that your Holy Spirit just come upon us, that we may live in powerful ways and do good work for your kingdom by what we say and by what we do. We pray all these things and give you all the things we have spoken aloud and upon our hearts and minds. We give all these things to you in the powerful and precious name of Jesus. And we continue in our time of prayer, praying as Jesus has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Well, let's stand together and sing our closing praise, No Longer Slaves. You unravel me with a melody.
Go forth in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Go forth knowing this truth. You are the beloved child of God. God is pleased with you. You bring him great joy when you call upon his name, when you worship him, and when you serve him faithfully. So go forth and serve him by what you say and do. And know this great truth. You serve Emmanuel, and our God is with us every step of the journey. Amen. Amen. Let's sing our closing praise as we prepare to depart.
it's not freezing rain.